We are back. It's This Week in Science, ready for another live podcast broadcast. I'm so excited for tonight's show, and we're absolutely going to be hitting the tight 90. Absolutely. The dream of dreams. Are you all ready for a good science show? Because I think we're ready for it right now. And um, as we get into it, jumping into the science, we're going to bring you all the science news. Make sure you hit the likes and the uh, shares and all the things to get us into the algorithms on the Facebook, Twitch, and the YouTubes. And um, this is not edited. It is live. And so the podcast will be edited to reflect that. Are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's do it. Okay. Let's do that. It's a time for that now. Let's do that. We are going to start the show. Hello, everyone in the chat rooms and in the Discord. Starting the show in a three, two, this is Twiss. This Week in Science, episode number 929, recorded on Wednesday, June 7th, 2023. What will you do with all this science? Hey, everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with bird dreams, touchy plants, and RoboChef. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program is provided on an as-is basis, as is the culture you're living in, the resources you have access to, and the planet upon which you are spinning. The current environment you are experiencing should not be considered permanent, and there is no implied expectation of warranty or prolonged habitability on Earth, as past climate is no guarantee for future conditions. While considerable effort is being made to raise awareness and inform the public, any action taken to prevent climactic climate change should have taken place before the awareness was sought. The media is not covering the crisis. No government is taking control of the situation. Industries are not changing their behavior. And the people who are in power do not have your best interests in mind. I repeat, those with the power to make change do not have your best interest in mind. And while there's still a chance that one day science may science our way out of this global extinction event, there's also a very good chance that it won't. In which case, the only thing that will really matter is another episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go. to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode Hello. of this week in science we are back again with all the science that you can fit in your head that's right that's we that's that's what we're doing thanks everyone for joining us happy vcr day Go oh get man those. that's so fun Big old tapes out of storage and celebrate back in the day when Twist was one of the few media outlets that was discussing the fact that climate change was an issue. <sighs> I was still, oh. go I mean, yes, there were DVDs and everything at the point, but I was still renting VHS tapes oh, for from the sure. local anime Wait a store. Second. Wait a in second. Be kind, rewind, man. Is, early as I recall, the first syndicated version of this show yeah. was cassette tapes oh, that would get sure. mailed out even further so, <laughs> mailed out <laughs> yeah no you that was a mailed thing. a cassette tape <laughs> you never mailed a, uh, maybe i'm remembering yeah. a different show I'm, yeah the, post, you are the postman I'm took it uphill both ways in the snow right yeah yeah <laughs> there you go no i still have the vhs i have some my hand i have that some vhs is just in the other room it's I still got some. I'm sure the tracking is problematic, but 
Yeah, <laughs> most likely. I mean, especially if you're trying to watch that VHS tape on a DVD player or your live streaming whatever box that you have on I your... think you'll start a fire. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be toxic. So let's not do that. On this week's show, we have lots of science news. I have stories about space exploration with Jay Wist, Forever Chemicals, our Robo Chef Future, Privacy, Psychedelic Brains, and Bird Dreams. Wow. I always have bird dreams. What do you have for us, Justin? I've got a fishy Younger Dryas story, more human intelligence competition. Uh, one thing we could do to stop global warming and some news from the Amazon. Ooh, from the Amazon, bring it. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh yes, what did I even bring for you today? Hmm. Um, I have some endangered species and I have some unusual mimicry. And before we get in the animal corner, I have those touchy plants you mentioned. Touchy, touchy. We got to find out all about that. As we jump into the show, everyone, I want you to know that if you subscribe to This Week in Science on any one of those many platforms for the podcast or for the live streaming or for the, you know when you want to watch the video later... You know, that's a great thing to do. You should do that. So subscribe. And you can find us weekly Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific time on Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube. Right there, right now, everybody. Oh, my gosh. Say hi. Where are you? Which chat room are you in? Say hello. And tell your friends about it. Make sure to share the news about the live streams every time we have a new episode. And subscribe and hit those likes. And um, if this isn't your thing, just make sure that you head to twist.org and you can find information about the show there. Yes? Or you can write in and request an audio cassette tape. <laughs> that you will you. never receive. Send a town crier with a scroll. <laughs> <laughs> that would actually be very funny. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. I now acclaim it is the beginning henceforth of twists. Okay, time for the science? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the opposite of old-timey tech. Yes, the dead. very, very opposite of old-timey tech. Let's first discuss new-timey tech of the J-WIST, the James yes. Webb Space Telescope, which is peeking out at the universe even now, collecting data that it is then that is then being analyzed by researchers, astrophysicists around the globe, for various ends with various questions in mind. And two particular studies came to the forefront this week. One is looking at the, has, has looked very far back into the furthest reaches of light that has been sent to our little planet from elsewhere. And in that looking Researchers at uh, UCLA and internationally have uh, confirmed the faintest, the dimmest galaxy in the universe uh, that we've seen so far. And what do we mean by faint? Well, it just isn't very bright. Most of the galaxies we see, we see because they're bright and they're putting off a lot of light, emitting a lot of radiation. There's a lot of electromagnetic spectrum that is out there and they're just like, hi, I'm here, you can see me. But the further you go back, especially considering the stuff that was right at the, like at the end of the, the cosmic microwave background era, the, the time of the the great ionization, um, you start having, you started having coalescing into universes, galaxies, not universes, into galaxies, stars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the researchers think that looking at the really, really dim things out there that are obviously very far away uh, could be looking that far back. And so these researchers have just published in Nature their uh, confirmation of a particular galaxy called JD1. JD1 is the most distant and dimmest galaxy identified to, to date. It um, is 
the first one of the first galaxies to be emerging from that fog of ions that we now still kind of hear as the static if you have a radio or a television. Um, they have confirmed that it was approximately uh, 13.4 billion years ago that this galaxy came into existence. So it was uh, a few hundred thousand years after the beginning of the universe, which was about 13.8 billion years ago. Um, and so these really dim galaxies are very rare. We really haven't seen them. And this is an amazing step forward because without JWIST, we never would have been able to see this very dim galaxy. I got to so wait a second, though. We're talking about a whole galaxy. And it only took a couple hundred thousand years, like on a galactic time scale. That does not seem like very much time. I, uh, right. Something's wrong with somebody's math. Yeah. So, okay. So they, they, this was uh, the light that we are seeing. They think it's really, they've, uh, as from what they can tell, this was emitted 13.3, 13 to 4.4 billion years ago when the university was only about 4% of its present age. That this, this is like the first, the first, you know, not big deal galaxy, not the bigger ones, but this is like an old dim galaxy and we're just starting to see that light. I'm, I'm totally uh, willing to, to say, okay, that's, it's that early. It's that long ago. Because mm -hmm. that dim and everything else. But then to say, but we're sticking with the number of how old the universe is. And it took uh, six weeks for that, uh, that early galaxy to form. I, that's the part I'm like, can you just, you, if you drop that number out of the discussion, right. Right. then I'm okay with it being 13.4 billion years old. If you tell me the yeah. universe can only be 13.6 billion years old... And I, or not even that. It would be less than that. Like, forget it. It's, it's, I need, I think things still took time. Well, it's, it's very interesting because we have also our idea of, co of, uh, cosmic expansion or universal expansion, right? So the, this was light that has actually been traveling to us for over 25 years million years or 25 billion years i'm sorry um that the that because of expansion the light was emitted 13.3 billion years ago it's been traveling towards us for some 25 26 billion years and it's finally reached us um and still we had to use gravitational lensing to be able to see it we that using you know the bending of space time by gravitational bodies uh to make it possible for us to even see this in the first place. So there are a lot of assumptions in place. And I do agree with you there because we've, we're kind of like, this is this, this date, you know, but so far, basically all the evidence lines up that this is when this stuff started inflation, big, ba big bang, inflation, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And then this is we're we're hitting the, the front edge of the wave of galactic. Here's okay. Formation. Here's a problem. The universe is how old? Like 13.8 billion and years how old. How long did it take for the light to get to us? 25 or well, so, okay, maybe And how old is the universe? The third, fourth, yeah, exactly. Okay. The expansion rate, which we're still trying yeah, it's, to... It's, it's math. <laughs> it's the math is just not right. Okay. I will continue to shake... You my you old shake manny your, fist for my yes, front shake lawn. Your, shake your stick math at it. And <laughs> can't be right. <laughs> Mr. Physicist who studies this all the time. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say not, something I really controversial now, which is, does it really matter? It's just really old. <laughs> it's really, really, really old. Thank you. Yeah. Well, there's, and when there's we're that. talking that old, it's like, uh, it's, we get it. It's really yeah. old. 
<laughs> yeah. At some point, how a thing started doesn't matter. It's all the things that happened after that that are really the interesting things anyway. Well, and then there's the relativity exactly. of time and space. And then, like, did time travel the same? Did things Until pass the, the same way? It's I want to the inspire the next billion. generation <laughs> to investigate these things. Because once they get general relativity and... You know, all yeah. the expansion, inflation, and all these things figured out, you know, then maybe we'll have our wormhole time travel kind of stuff. You sure. Know? Sure. So, You're you know, right. Just, You're right, of course. This is all about inspiration, curiosity, inspiration. Keep asking the question. I mean, today, right here, right now, does 14 billion years ago matter and a few quibblings of hundreds of thousands of years? No, but yes. Yes, there are great people out there working on these questions. Um, oh, yes. But again, to talk about something else that uh, happened probably about 12 billion years ago, so a little more recently in our <laughs> universal timeline, um, the JWIST has also, thanks again to something that is called an Einstein ring, which is also uh, a gravitational lensing of a sort, uh, researchers have been able to image a the, the oldest or most distant complex organic molecules in the universe 12 billion what? years ago. Yeah, what? What do you mean? What are you talking about? So an Einstein ring is a situation where one galaxy is lined up exactly behind another galaxy or gravitational body um, within, within our view of space. And the lensing occurs so that the galaxy in the back gets, instead of melted and warped and magnified around one side of the, the intervening gravitational body, it gets warped in a ring around the outside of whatever that gravitational body is. So it's a ring with the of the distant galaxy so that we can actually look at the, the chemical signatures, the molecular signatures, the light signatures that are there to be able to get an idea of what's happened in that galaxy that we can't really see that's yeah. smeared around as a magnified ring. Yeah, and but how useful is that? I mean... <laughs> So, so, uh, and uh, so, what I mean is, like, yeah, like I get when we're doing a chemical analysis of something like the trails coming off of a comet. It can tell us oh, what that comet's made up of. But this is a whole galaxy. There's a bunch of uh, suns and planetoids and like yes. everything. It's yes. not just solar. That, it's solar. That, many, many, many solar systems. This so is like a, getting this an, a mean. Yes, of this a galaxy. background. Yes, a galaxy. It's a mean. It's an average. It's a smear. This galaxy that they were looking at uh, in the background, they were able to take a generalized signature of what you know that because we know the way that different light interacts and and what to look for. And actually, uh, one of the researchers on this study that again was published in Nature. Um, from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and also some students at uh, with researchers at Texas A&M University and international collaborators. One of the researchers actually did their PhD thesis on this background galaxy that's got smeared out and the potential of using an Einstein ring to be able to look at the, its light. And now they're a researcher and able to actually use JWIST to do what they talked about doing in their PhD dissertation. So like that in itself is pretty cool. The galaxy that JWIST focused on is SPT0414-47. And this was discovered by NSF's South Pole Telescope. And it was a dust obscured galaxy um, that they kind of figured was... Uh, about 12 billion light years from Earth when it first was born. Wow. So it came of age at about 1.5 billion years after the universe got its start, give or take quibblings. Um, but they were take, able to look at the spectroscopic data that they understand from other 
analyses of various things, look at the light and yes, the average light. And they were able to determine that not only did it just have basic molecular com components, but there were spectroscopic signatures of a, a an organic compound called polycyclic aromatic, aromatic hydrocarbon, PAH. And PAH actually is a molecule that's emitted from our cars and oh you might it might be in the skies right now over those canadian forest fires probably mm -hmm. uh <laughs> but they are also considered because they're organic and they are these uh cyclic compounds uh that and hydrocarbons that they are uh some of the basic building blocks of life so the idea is that even though it is a smear these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons suggest that there are the building blocks for life. And if we think of it as like forest fires and, um, <laughs> you know, the exhaust from our, our vehicles burning fossil fuels, this suggests that, you know, maybe that smear contained some, some aspect of life in it. Possibly. But, but, is it destroyed life? But, is it life that came yeah. before? We don't know. And, is it and just to, a to thing? See, to see it even in this gl a galactic smear, how common would it have to be? Yes, exactly. I mean, this, is, yeah. this doesn't sound like it would be one planet somewhere in that galaxy. Right. In one solar system where somebody Yeah, I guess would, that's the question. Would, would someone looking at us yeah. from that far away be able to recognize right? complex organic molecules in and I our would, I would system. guess no. Maybe I'm wrong, but I would guess no. I guess I would think planet Earth alone wouldn't be enough to make the right. Milky Way have that as a signature. Yeah, exactly. So that would have to suggest on some level that it's yeah, actually it's a, pretty common. Yeah, you know, building block the, of life. So is it, you know, before in the process of the evolution of the, the galaxy, or is it toward the end of the evolution of the galaxy? I, we don't know. It's, you know, 12 billion the, years ago, so. The thing about space is that it's really It's really big, big. yeah, and, very big. And uh, I heard an analogy the other day that if if the, the universe was the ocean, what we've observed thus far is it would fit in like a coffee mug. <laughs> like yep. we maybe really maybe a glass. for as for as as far as we <laughs> yeah I was gonna say a thimble a thimble <laughs> as far as we have looked and as much as we have seen and as much as we have learned we've still just barely barely explored just what space is the surface yeah. So much to learn. Well, turning it back on us a little bit, one last quick story for this intro space uh, segment. Um, researchers at Caltech have announced the successful uh, pilot of their MAPLE project, which is a part of their SSPD project. What is all this stuff? Well, MAPLE stands for Microwave Array for Power Transfer Low Orbit Experiment which is within this SSPD or Caltech Space Solar Power Demonstrator, which is part of the Space Solar Power Project. So what have they done? Well, they have a little satellite in space that they launched up into space. It's collecting solar energy on uh, small solar panels it has receiver or it has uh, a a setup that takes that energy and trans and transforms the solar energy into a direct current that can be can be sent by transmitters wait, and they the transmitters did they, make, did they make a space laser it's not a laser not a laser no just like pulses of yeah. and not it's not a laser their idea is that they want to be part of developing a, a democratic worldwide free energy program where instead of just the sun beaming down on us is sending sunlight to us that we can then harness here on the surface of the earth earth the idea is that 
if you have a receiver on the surface of the planet and there is a transmitter up over the, the planet in space that is collecting that solar energy, that w energy can be wirelessly transmitted directly from space. Just Don't do the tran just transformation have in space. A way to wirelessly get energy from the sun down to the earth. Like it, it's it feels like it's an unnecessary step. Uh, yes and no, because the way that power is generated, and at this point in time, solar power is still um, not widespread enough to make it uh, easily accessible. And the idea is that this would be the kind of situation where a receiver system could be set up in a uh, war-torn area in a third world country um maybe even in the you know someplace in the united states instead of putting together a solar power plant or putting together a uh a fossil fuel refinery or instead of you know mining for coal or doing a wind farm or whatever you have these receivers and those go directly into energy transmission lines here on the planet so energy can be transmitted transported here on the planet easily the idea is that it makes electricity available energy electricity available immediately highly um, skeptical very yes there's a lot of things a lot of questions <laughs> this here but... sounds like a way to keep people from creating their own energy on their home and instead make sure that energy companies are still in charge <laughs> I don't know. There's, I mean, there's, there are lots of questions. That are very, and, and there are, of course, lots of conversations to be had about, you know, sticking giant satellite arrays uh, with solar arrays in low Earth orbit up around the planet. Um, you know how that would affect all sorts of, uh, all sorts of um, night sky viewing and other other things. You know it, how many satellites can we and should we put up in orbit around our planet? What are the uses? Um, but this anyway, this particular demonstration successfully showed that they could take in solar energy on one side of the satellite. Fine, the ISS has solar panels. Great, they were able to turn uh, make electricity on their satellite. Woo woo. But then what they were able to do is transmit it across open space to a receiver a meter or so away. And that re there were two receivers that they were then able to use based on the directionality of the transmitter to turn on little LEDs on their satellite. So they just transmitted electricity wirelessly across mm -hmm. empty space. But not only that, they, yeah. so they said, so, wait, wait, wait. Not only did they just transmit the electricity across that's like 1930s technology, but okay. it is totally. And they turned on their LEDs and they went, woo woo, our satellite's working and this is working LEDs up there. More, more Additionally, recent. they were able to, there was a window installed in the, in the satellite that allowed the transmitter to send its signal toward the earth. And researchers at Pasadena's Caltech University had a, an array that was set up to receive a receiver that was set up to receive the signal and they were uh, able to read the signal at the appropriate time in the expected frequencies that were expected for the distance that the signal was traveling and you know blah 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 but so this is signal the 1950s was, though it energy what is, from what space is this signal? to earth okay okay if that's what the signal was powering up a bat they charged the phone they haven't done anything like that yet no so it's okay. all they haven't done any they it got a signal up a signal from yes. an object in orbit that can't be possible <laughs> i just like i haven't figured out why 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 yet well if you have a really really big solar array with a big transmitter dyson sphere well, not well. I mean, that's different altogether. But you could transmit a focused signal to a particular spot on a planet, which is maybe geosynchronously locked with the satellite, and have a wireless transmission of base of, of current. This is a wireless transmission of current. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but I mean, we've again. That's 1930s technology. 
Oh we, yeah, this is. I mean, this is Tesla's wild wireless. Yeah, uh, this is this is very yes. It's going the back free even energy before. Yes. from a giant tower. Yes. Yeah. But this anyway, sounds more um, helpful to me for it. like Mars colony stuff. Very possible. We have a lot of issues here on our our planet, though, still. But I just wanted to put it out there that demonstrated. Nine, and as you might be saying, 1930s technology, it's yeah. successful and, so far. And the they reason, have a lot of, they have a long way to go. This was a pilot. This is the yes. very first step in the process. Yeah. No, and, and then encourage them to keep going. The one yeah. thing that uh, turned out to be a, a obstacle for Tesla, creating a, a free energy generator that would just power people's devices mm -hmm. in their homes without wires, was that then there's no way to charge for it. Yeah. Well, that is a part of the idea here. Uh, the uh, the one of the individuals who is behind the funding of this yeah. research, he's a philanth philanthropist, uh, and he was ex he put money in ex excess of a hundred million dollars in support Goodbye. of the the project. To he's excited about the idea and ability to one day create a world powered by uninterruptible renewable energy. And I love that. I That's just, if, if anybody can tap into the same source of energy at the same time, it stops becoming a resource. Like, it, like there does, I don't know. Yeah, but this, yeah, bigger, different conversations. Yeah. Pilot study happened, very successful. Woo woo, let's talk about your issues with the younger Dryas. My issue, yeah, I've got nothing but issues right now. What is going on? <laughs> What's going on? Come on, okay, can this take is, old guy with your cane. I, am, I have a problem with every story I've looked at. Get out right. of my science yard. This is actually, I love this story. Re research led by Department of Anthropology at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks has uh, delved into freshwater fishing practices of ancient Native Americans in eastern Beringia, which is uh, western Australia. Uh, Australia, uh, western Alaska. So the team uh, went through... All these sites that were older than 7,000 years looking for fish. And they found eight sites that were identified uh, all near the Tanana River, off the tributary off the Yukon River. And these uh, eight of them that had actual, not just reports of fish being found, but actually had the material available to study. Seven of the sites we're dating from the Younger Dryas, which is 11,650 to 12,900 years old-ish. They found 1,100 and something fish that were identified. The fish that they identified were mostly fish that, uh, or were all fish that can be caught in those, those waterways today, with, with some interesting exceptions. They... All the identified, identified fish before 11,800 years ago were freshwater fish, meaning no salmon, basically. So something happened after Younger Dryas, maybe before, uh, caused by Younger Dryas, that may have cut off the supply, the ability for salmon to, to make it that far inland. And then after things warmed up again, uh, they start showing up. So Younger Dryas... For those who aren't familiar, it is a climate-driven extinction event. Uh, the planet was leaving the Ice Age. Continental glaciers were receding. Humans, megafauna, were expanding into new territories that were nice and lush in the Northern Hemisphere. And so everything was great. And then Younger Dryas happens. And suddenly we're back in the Ice Age, with some places that were having lower temperatures than there were at the glacial, glacial maximum. There's a pretty good uh, idea of what happened. The idea is that there's this giant inland lake because there's a continental glacier that's still there uh, before Younger Dryas starts. Over northeastern America and most of Canada, it's still a giant glacier there. That whole corridor thing in the west has opened up and it's gone. And what they think happened is this, this massive lake of melting uh, ice is formed. And at some point there's a glacial dam break. And it just pours 
a a freshwater cold water lake a third of the size of Canada into either the North Arctic or the North Atlantic uh, Ocean. And that shuts down the thermal conveyor belt of the Atlantic, which is why temperatures drop and things get really dry in the Northern Hemisphere. But the Southern Hemisphere is relatively unaffected. In Australia doesn't even notice that this has happened. Because it's, like it's, no it's, it's a climate incident, but it's localized. It's localized to the Northern yeah. Hemisphere, weather yeah. patterns change, and all of this. So one of the things that come out is it just, because I saw a Nova special once. I went, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that there was a comet that hit at the same time that this lake formed. And, and so I went looking into it, and basically, uh, yeah, the Younger Dryas impact theory Three things okay. you need to know about it. One, it's total nonsense. Two, <laughs> it should be studied. Like the papers should be studied. The research that went into it should be studied because it's a uh, prime example of data selection bias. Of like to to believe that there was a younger Dryas impact theory, you first have to believe that there was an impact. And then the data yeah. will fit. Yep. If you didn't yep. go in already believing it, none of the data make, uh, doesn't. Yeah. And oh then three gosh. is uh, actually to Blair's point for earlier. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> All the interesting stuff happens afterwards anyway. And yeah. in fact, it got to the point where the I think the last round of, of Younger Dryas impact theory was that this comet or asteroid or meteorite, whatever it is, hit the remaining ice pack and pushed it into the water. So it's, it, it ends up trying to slip in where the original, uh, I, you know, uh, glacial dam burst uh, started anyway. So it's cyclical and it's nonsense. Anyway, <laughs> it's a climate-driven event, regardless of how it started, vegetation dried up through prolonged droughts in some areas. When it was over, most of the large mammals of the Americas were gone. Horses, camels, giant sloths, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, short-faced bears, and woolly mammoth all went extinct. Which we're They're so also... sad about. And everybody's try still trying to bring back that mammoth. And maybe we should. Right. Anyway, uh, moving on. Because it turns out they were doing fine when things were warming up. It's when it got yeah. cold again that they had the problem. Uh, there were also mm -hmm. significant reductions in by the millions of bison, deer, caribou, moose, all the frequently hunted creatures by megafauna predators they all vanish mm -hmm. uh, so and so if you've ever thought that oh it's humans came to the americas and that's why everything went extinct way too many animals yeah. gone way too fast for it to have been humans it was I mean, not we human were, hunters. We, humans were hunting but that was just part right. of stuff and and in fact yeah. this is also when clovis culture uh disappears. disappeared mm -hmm. so clovis culture is like the most technologically advanced big game hunting uh stone to, stone spear type technology out there you have a spear tip that you throw the spear and the spear will fall off and this uh, the spear tip stays in the animal so you can reuse it mm -hmm. right you can take another spear tip you slap it in you can throw again it was like the most advanced thing that technology goes away people don't and what's interesting is the intensity of fishing at the tanana river basin shows up during the driest, isn't there before, shows up during younger driest, and then kind of diminishes again after. So what it's showing is that people switched when the big game dropped because of starvation, because of drying out, because of wildfires that were, were taking place, because like, mm -hmm. like we, know, we know in California and now in Canada, when you have a prolonged drought, wildfires take over, they wipe out the vegetation, the vegetarian animals are all dying off. The prey that were, or the predators of those animals were dying off. And the humans were like, eh, it's too far to walk to find anything to hunt. So they went, they turned to fishing. One of the things I also thought was interesting about this, uh, and it's not mentioned in the study, all these megafauna and big animals disappear at this point. You know what survived? Hmm. Brown bears. Interesting. Why do the other bears and the other big, you know, carnivore, omnivore, tiger, why do they disappear? 
brown bears fish. Oh, they fish. They fish. So here we have, here we have, that was the, it was the adaptability of humans and bears to be able to go, that's not available anymore. I'm going to switch to something else. And actually the bears may have already been heavily relying on fishing because there was this short faced bear, which is like this bigger, huge, the biggest bear that ever lived that used to actually be quick enough and big enough to, to hunt animals. Like it would hunt prey. Like brown bears don't really like chase deer. So that's cool. They were pushed maybe into having to forage on berries and and fish because there was a larger apex predator bear around. But anyway, bears and humans, uh, it, it was Survived. fishing that got them through the Younger Dryas, and there was no impact. Well, you know. I hope that we'll all be able to survive on the fish. Oh, wait, we're killing all the fish. Anyway, Blair, tell us about the plants. How do the plants feel yes. about all this? How do they feel? Well, I don't know, but I know that they do feel, which is really what this study is about. Um, this is from Washington State University. We know that plants can respond to touch in certain ways that was one of our very first twist shorts was about the mimosa plant that can respond to touch for example but this recent study has shown that plants can sense not only when something touches them but also when they stop touching them and so uh it's it's a unique signal the difference between being touched and the touching stopping which is an interesting identification considering that plants don't have nerve cells. So how can they tell this kind of very distinct stimuli and the stopping of stimuli without nerve cells? Um, in a set of experiments, individual plant cells responded to the touch of a very fine glass rod by sending slow waves of calcium signals to other plant cells. And when that pressure was released, they sent more rapid waves, a distinct new signal throughout oh. their cells. This is 84 experiments on 12 plants using thale crests and tobacco plants. They had been specifically bred to include calcium sensors. Uh, calcium channels are something that is being studied pretty heavily. And so um, it's something that, that uh, kind of was found in plants and is, is the inspiration to an entire field of study. Uh, but so because of that, there's already selective breeding happening for plants that have really sensitive calcium channels. So um, they were able to kind of use these guys. They applied a slight touch with a micro cantilever, which is the tiny glass rod I mentioned. It's about the size of a human hair. And so they saw these very complex responses that were different between touch and the removal of touch. And so... Um, that's important because we have specialized cells throughout our bodies like nerve cells, but plants are all the cells are kind of the same. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter which cell it is. Um, they can kind of send these cascading signals throughout the plant uh, through these calcium channels. In future studies, they want to figure out what, um, what triggers downstream events. So basically um, okay, great, you're sending these signals. Why and what happens as a result of these signals? Is it the starting of touching? Is it the stopping of touching? Is there a response to both? What are those responses? And so that's kind of the next step is why would they have a response to these two pieces? And what are those responses? So I think that's really cool. But um, it's not just, you know, I got poked and I'm responding it's I recognize I am currently being touched and now I recognize the touching has stopped. Yeah. So first thing I'm thinking is going to be one is, am I being eaten? And, right. And if so, I should then, you know, if I determine that I'm being eaten, maybe stop sending nutrients to that part of me. Right. Or and send, the other is, oh, or send chemicals, right? Distress chemicals out, right? Signals. Yeah, or the, yeah. right, yeah, or counter effect. chemicals, yeah. And then the stop touching is, okay, uh, let's get in there and fix stuff. If anything's broken, let's put it back together. Uh, whatever was eating us has moved on. 
Because I think that's what the plant's got to just worry about. As far as worry goes, you know, be concerned because you're stuck in one place. You're mostly concerned with uh, damage and repair. I well, wonder... so that's that's what I would want to know, though, is if yeah. plants can tell the difference between touch and the severing of cells, because those can be very different no nerves. stimuli. No nerves. Right. But can they tell? Is there a difference between breaking a cell wall and poking a cell? And then, so a, what a, if the signals right. themselves are just like an MRI of itself? You know what I mean? Like, we'll send these out, out. And if they all come back, we're good. If we send or them out and half are missing, come, yeah, does it have to come back? There's no, I mean, what's the sensory aspect? Yeah, of yeah I know. Yeah, it's just Fair sending enough. a signal out. But why? Maybe it causes a break. We know plants can sense vibration, mm -hmm. they can hear. Maybe it is, maybe it's involved in reproduction or mm. you know maybe there I don't know. So many ideas. Why does a plant need to know when it's not being touched? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the answer to this. Hopefully they can find what signals get oh. turned on and off and we'll find um, out. I'm confident. Yeah. It will happen. It will happen, yes. Oh, do I have a story now? Yes. You do. Oh, what's happening with... Oh, I turned myself off. Nope. I, there's something weird You're happening. Here. You're here. Okay. We see We're you and we hear five you. Five by four. Sorry, there was something weird happening in my stream yard back end here. So anyway, all right. Oh. Um, let's talk about uh, Forever Chemicals. Just for oh. a moment. P5! Boo! Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we don't like forever chemicals because why? Because they they're forever. Around. Yeah, they stick yeah. around forever. They don't yeah. disintegrate over time. They just kind of stick around and, oh, gee, not just stick around, cause all sorts of environmental and health problems. Research published just at the end of uh, it's like the May 31st, June 1st this last week in Annals of Global Health uh, from UCSF. Researchers at UCSF's Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment took advantage of documents that had been kept secret by DuPont and 3M, the largest manufacturers of PFAS, that ended up in the University of California's uh, document database. They have a UCSF Chemical Industry Documents Library. They got a hold of these documents from an individual um, who uh, Robert Billot, who is an attorney who filed a lawsuit against DuPont for the toxic nature of, um, of PFAS contamination. And also his story was in a documentary called Dark, Dark Waters. Um, and then there's another documentary, The Devil We Know, who, who ended up donating these documents to the University of California in San Francisco. However, nobody had really ever analyzed them before. And in analyzing all the documents, the researchers say they will, were able to determine that um, having the documents allowed us to see what the manufacturers knew and when, and also how polluting industries keep critical public health information private. So uh, not much was known about PFAS toxicity for about 50 years after it started, after it was invented and it started being used. And the research states without a doubt that very similarly to techniques used by the sugar industry and also the cigarette manufacturing industry that DuPont had evidence of PFAS toxicity from internal animal and occupational studies that they did not publish in the scientific literature and failed to report to the EPA as required under the TSCA. They were all marked, the documents were all marked as confidential. And in some cases, industry executives are explicit it, that they wanted this memo destroyed <laughs> okay okay so yeah lock so, them up right <laughs> are they this? alive these people the, the companies researchers, need, the companies are great <laughs> the companies need to get sued out of every dollar they have they been have. sued and uh, they need but, to be resued Yes. And not so this capped is, and not, this, uh, whoa, yeah. let's make a settlement here and then never again. No, 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 no. This is different. Yeah. This is all there new were lawsuits. Game. So lawsuits were uh, filed in 1998 and 2002. And this kind of brought media attention to the 
to PFAS contamination. Um, in 2004, the EPA fined DuPont for not disclosing their findings on PFOA, not PFAS, uh, and there was a $16.45 million settlement that was the largest civil penalty obtained How under much? the U.S. environmental studies, environmental statute, 16, $16.45 million. Nothing. Compared That's to nothing. their one, DuPont alone has $1 billion in annual revenues from PFOA yearly. yearly. That was in Yeah, this is, this is one of those things. So, why, yeah. why can't businesses be canceled? <laughs> like, yeah. why aren't you not no. allowed to business anymore at this point? Yeah. yeah. So this is the question that I that I bring. We have this scientific information. We have whistleblowers. We have people who have brought this information to bear. And now finally, decades later, we have mm -hmm. research analyzing these documents that can state, hey, yeah, not only was it shown in these lawsuits that they knew stuff, but these documents really, really say these executives knew what was going on and they hid it and they lied about it for profits. And this is, they, this is not in the best interest of the public health. So, so, how, so do we, how do we increase transparency in chemical, chemical driven industries? How do we increase um, regulations? How can we create a, uh, an industry in which we expect that chemicals are going to do bad things and they're not allowed to be used until they are proven to be fine in most. So one suggestion I would have yeah. is if any of these people are alive, they should be in jail for the suing the company is one thing. If there's individuals okay, yeah. who's, who viewed these documents, wanted them destroyed, if they're alive, they should be in prison. Yeah. Second, you should generationally multi-generationally claw back every dollar that they earned from that company. Yeah. Claw and back. It, if it's, if yeah. they're gone and their children's children are living off of that money, it should be clawed back. Yeah. But this is a case where the science has taken, is taking time, has taken time. And I, I hope this is a story that continues to make its way out into the media and into the public, uh, because this is the kind of information that people need to know about, that, that these corporations, that executives have put profits over people and um, yeah, as early as 1961, Teflon's chief of tech toxicology, col chief oh, of toxicology dead. discovered that Teflon materials had the ability to increase the size of the liver of, of rats at low doses. Advised the chemicals be handled with extreme care and that contact with skin should be avoided. It's already dead. 1970 internal memo, DuPont funded Haskell Laboratory uh, found one particular PFOS called C8 to be highly toxic when inhaled and moderately toxic when ingested. 1979, they People discovered dogs too. who were exposed to a single dose of PFOA died two days after ingestion. 1980, DuPont and 3M learned two of eight pregnant employees who had worked in C8 manufacturing had children with birth defects. And they stated in an internal memo, we know of no evidence of birth defects caused by C C8 at DuPont. <laughs> well, yeah, because so. they didn't study it because they were like, hey, never have this kind of study. Yeah, don't we do that. Never we should never look into this. We should never. We don't have um, nothing of it. Yeah. So this uh, this uh, article, The Devil They Knew, Chemical Documents and Chemical Documents Analysis of Industry Influence on P PFAS Science is in the Annals of Global Health. And we will, of course, link to these stories on um, our website. Clawback. So, I don't care if it's great grandchildren. Yeah. Clawback any dollar that they have. Uh, it's ill gotten. Yes. Yeah. I, I mm. don't need my nonstick pan. It. The nonstick pit. We, well, we actually, I, I kind of do. Yeah, you know what? Maybe it's not worth it. Just season, right. season your pans. Whatever. Maybe it's, I mean, all maybe right. it's not. Uh, maybe it is was worth it. Yeah. It's, it's, We're all it's gonna too die hard. anyway. Cast Who iron. Cares? Remember that? <laughs> yeah, rusting pans. This is a very fatalist show. No, I'm contributing. No I'm not going to say I'm not. But <laughs> let's oh let's talk goodness. about let's talk about ah, some maybe, ancient maybe, grave diggers. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was the right choice. Brief, brief discussion of uh, ancient grave diggers. <laughs> <laughs> brief. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, you know, so you remember Homo Nolati? 
Mm-hmm. The they found all those dead hominins in the cave. Yes. I mean, obviously they're dead. The, they were... the cave that they had to only have little little anthropologist archaeologists <laughs> to hire and go climb tiny into. female anthropologists <laughs> to go spelunking into this mm-hmm. cave. Uh, this is a this is two hundred forty thousand ish years ago to three hundred thousand years ago. This is a this was a new hominin that we found a while ago, and we knew that they were burying their dead because or or placing their dead in this underground uh, cave because the ages were all disparate. It wasn't like a bunch of you know people of any certain time point had died and got buried in there or anything that they were being placed in there over time. Well, now they're suggesting the bodies that were found in the cave were not simply deposited, but were carefully positioned and then covered up, buried. Buried. In the cave. Which and would... this wasn't this one of the ideas when they first kind of like, ooh, there's a bunch of bones, and maybe this was a ceremonial gravesite. Like that was well, one of the at least they... knew it was grave because you can you can kind of tell when there's not specific injuries like there's it wasn't the cave collapse when they have you know when you have a population that is mostly elderly but then some young it looks like a graveyard Mm -hmm. statistically so the oldest human burial is about seventy three thousand years old that we know of man maybe it's older if you count the neanderthals in that but this is this is 240 plus thousand years old and then they also suggest that there was, they found cross-hatched etchings in the walls that have been placed there over at various times and mm. some food offerings in this, what is now a tomb, what is now you can conceive of as an underground uh, mausoleum. They have some, some animal offerings to the dead. They have this cross-hatching patterns, symbology on the walls. And they think for all of this to take place, uh, they, they must have had, well, they, some of the, the animal offerings were, were cooked in the cave. Huh. Okay, so they were using it. Yeah. they had fire, which also makes mm-hmm. sense because it's really dark. And if you're going in there and positioning and then burying and then making you cross-hatching patterns on the rock, you need light. So this is fire control symbolic etchings and burial hundreds of thousands of years before humans even came up with the idea that you should get rid of that uh, rotting body. So amazing further, further challenges. And it's also, you know, I've talked, I do the stories about the different kinds of fire making last time. Neanderthals and modern humans having different fire kits. The and different that, that strategies, yeah. The n- different strategies, but the sort of knowledge for it had to predate. So we're, now we're also like Homo naledi, which is very separate from a uh, distant, distant, distant cousin, not even as close as, as humans and Neanderthals. And so when you start to paint the picture is, if you, if you have all of the overlapping things between different cultures of hominins, Chances are it predates, it goes back further. So you've got humans, Homo naledi, Neanderthal, who can make fire, does cave art, buries dead. You start to come up with this list of, these are not convergent technology evolutions that are taking place. These are, must have had the capacity in an ancestor. Yeah. Because there's too many things. Like if it was just one over here and one over there, then maybe you can make that argument. But the overlap of all of these abilities and, you know, cave art to burial to fire control and use suggests that all of these things probably go back much further than the split between humans and Neanderthals. And if they're in Naledi, which is a very distant cousin, then you're going back even further into time when hominins would have been rather intelligent. I think the next thing you're going to find is Homo naledi may actually have had language. We're, right. we're pretty much there with Neanderthals. Like there's no, there's I mean, no way still... they could do what they did without language. 
that still really does depend on, uh, you know, their anatomy specifically and, you know, what they were capable of. But, um, you know, there are a lot of questions that I do want to point out that uh, researchers are a bit upset again at the way that this particular researcher is approaching his research. Um, so this work that is currently in the, in the news about Homo Naledi is a preprint, but they treated it of with three papers of three, yeah, of three papers. It's three preprints that have, so they, they are still going through peer review. They have not been accepted for publication yet. And the researchers treat and the researchers have been treating them and media with an embargo date. So today or yesterday or whatever it was, was like the day that the news could come out because it was the day that the papers were published on the preprint server. You know, so it was all timed to be a media circus to for the show, uh, for, all, the show. They, it's all all for twists. The sensationalist as aspect of it. Um, and so researchers are really concerned about the fact that these, uh, that Berger, Berger is, um, is promoting his, his work yeah. above and beyond the actual science of it. And, and not doing it in the appropriate way. So there are, there are concerns and people do have questions about the sedimentation and how the bones were laid down and the evidence that's been used. But because it hasn't been reviewed, you know, it hasn't been accepted. So Yeah, yeah. The, the, so uh, my side gig now is, is writing up studies. Mm -hmm. And I, it, sometimes they seem to be, uh, you know, there's a lot of, really bad things that get bad studies that get published like oh for sure awful, that are awful. studies yeah. that can get published still yeah. so i don't think i think at this point the credibility of the publishing industry isn't so high <laughs> that you would <laughs> you would care what they say first yeah before you know what i mean like like, good for them uh, taking ownership of their own research and saying, here's what we found and talking to the public and making it a public spectacle and a big story because that's what is needed. If the publications are whining that they didn't get it first and they wanted to be able to be the, be the gatekeeper for the scientific information, well, your gatekeeping skills suck. The scientific <laughs> publishing industry, you're, you know, that, that's why entire journal entire journals full of tens of thousands of published stories every year have just been decredited yeah because there's i mean so the, much, and it and so it could also be there. it could also be that this researcher is very smart because of uh you know he, the research is in bioarchive. It is on a public preprint server, so anyone can see the work ahead of time. Um, it is going to be peer reviewed. They have uh, they have a lot of faith in their results, obviously, to be pushing it through uh, the media before they've been accepted. But at the same time, considering the funding environment for research like this and for um, you know th this is the kind of storytelling that is. You know, this is science communication that has a very specific purpose, which is to get the story out there in a great way that is led by the scientists themselves and not by the media. Um, and then that conversation can be led by the scientist and can also gather in for uh, gather uh, enthusiasm in the public that potentially will lead to philanthropy, funding and a uh, bigger wallet to be able to do future work with yeah I, you know so there is that aspect also yeah. um hey blair you look really hungry right now oh i do oh yeah so hungry would you love to have uh food prepared by a robot i i guess that's fine <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of a reason that would be a problem other than that you can't taste test it. No, there's no taste mm. testing involved. But uh, researchers at Cambridge University have uh, have published their work with their robot chef that has learned how to cook. 
I mean, this is a, a tentative term for this state of the, the research, but has learned how to cook from watching videos. The researchers took wow. videos of themselves holding up food items wow. like a carrot so that the uh, computer's camera and AI could identify the object and categorize it, classify it. And then uh, the human chopped up the carrot and or chopped, did the same with an apple and then put the ingredients together in a number of uh, very simple recipes. So these are like, they're calling them salads, but it's like okay. chunks of carrot and apple together okay. and <laughs> they taught the they taught the robot how to put together these simple salads in the way that uh people learn how to cook by watching youtube videos so the Just idea right. is that instead of being like programming the right. the robot this is what you do and they're only programmed to do one particular thing that the robot chef could learn to identify particular foods and in the process and and understand how they go together with different ingredients and then potentially be able to uh, make make food. Very simplistic at this point in time. Okay. And they do yes, yeah. this, this explains to me why this is different because I was I was gonna say I have ordered why? a coffee from a robot before. Yes. I did this at the Metreon yes. in San Francisco. And so I got an espresso from a robot. And um the difference is I hit a button for the espresso and that was programmed into the arm. So it it knew what to do based on a button that I pushed. So that's a very straightforward code yeah. as opposed to this this arm watched a bunch of videos <laughs> and learned yes. how to cook learned yeah. that this yes or I, I am again object. i'm gonna put yes. giant air quotes on cook though because yes. this is <laughs> it's it's more <laughs> like you taught it how to put how to it's almost akin to like he, here's how to make something out of legos like take a take an apple Take a carrot, put them in a bowl. <laughs> right. And so, yes, this is early, early stages. But the idea is that this is a robot and uh, a machine learning system algorithm behind the robot that learns through observation and that that observation could eventually go from these very simplistic videos that are made in the lab to maybe one day a robot like this will view YouTube cooking videos and become, you know, learn to be a real, a chef. Yeah. I think so. the, the, the thing is a, an apple is an apple, a carrot is a carrot and a, and uh -huh. a blade is a blade. Right. And so like those things respond in a pretty consistent way. But if once you add mm -hmm. heat to the equation, there's lots it's of variables so you need to variables. adjust as you go. No two pieces of any food cook the same under the same mm -hmm. level of heat. And so, yeah, that gets way more complex once you actually put what I consider cooking into the equation, yeah. which is heat, right? So, <laughs> Everyone would be happy to have a chef that doesn't taste my food before I get it. That sounds <laughs> gross. Also... I think I would only want a vegetarian robot cook. I'd just be afraid that it would <laughs> misidentifying meat <laughs> would be could be dangerous. Uh, it's in there with the knives. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, Psst, come here. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I need to come over a little closer. No. Um, but now it is you're, important. You're, you're mixing up yeah. cooking with butcher roles, which are very right. different. Very different. But the the question <laughs> is, you know, if a robot chef is going to be identifying various ingredients in front of it for some kind of cooking that it's supposed to be doing, how does it identify the difference between a carrot and a sweet potato? How does it identify the difference between you know a lemon and an orange? There are um, a lot of very nuanced differences in food items. There are differences. And also if it's going to be learning from viewing videos, YouTube videos very often hands obscure the, the actual food that's being cooked. Um, so that makes it uh, difficult also, for identification the most important, to take place. 
the most important part is always missing from the YouTube videos that I would yes. want the robot for, which is cleaning up. Clean, <laughs> clean up your mess. <laughs> I, after. I'll cook my own food. That's <laughs> the fun part. It's the cleaning up that's this really a, a drag. Point. Yeah. That's what I want the robot to do. I still want my child to, to learn that. Oh, 12 year olds. It's hard. This is This Week in Science. We hope that you are enjoying the show. We're having a really good time here ourselves. We're cooking with science. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you are enjoying the show, please share it with a friend today. Make sure you tell someone you care about that they should listen to Twists or that they should watch Twists. Get it on your, your mobile device right now. Bring it up and share it with somebody you care about. And uh, because Twists will you know, care about them too. We care about the science in their lives. Also, if you want to help support Twists, head over to twist.org, click on the Patreon link, and choose your level of support to help support the ongoing production of Twists. Become an executive producer of the show. $10 and more a month, and we will thank you by name at the end of the show. We really can't do this without you. Thank you for all of your support. Okay, coming on back to more This Week in Science. It's time for... Oh, yeah, yeah, it's that time. It's that time. Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? Oh my goodness. Uh, do you want uh, a fun story or some bad news first? <laughs> you know, the, I think eat, I eat always the prefer the eat bad the news first. Yeah, eat the frog. Eat the frog? Eat the frog. Yeah, What's do that? do the hard thing first. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I don't... I do actually have a story about frogs eating beetles later, so I got very confused. <laughs> anyway. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's talk about the bad news. Um, essentially, our conservation efforts... Uh, are messing things up specifically in Australia. Uh, this is a study looking at the woily, which is, um, a small, uh, marsupial that hops around also co called, uh, brush tailed betongs. They're really important to the, the, the environment in Australia, they improve soil health through digging. A single woylie could turn over about five tons of soil every year. So they're pretty important. Um, but they were once abundant across Australia and you guessed it. They're now endangered due to all the same reasons all of the marsupials are in Australia. Habitat loss, but also cats and foxes. Uh, those darn cats are just eating so many delicious tiny marsupials. This is why Australia and New Zealand really are not fans of outdoor cats. <laughs> it's because they're really, the, yeah, they're not good for the native species. Anyway. Whaleys are so cute. Yes, show oh us some pictures. So goodness, I've got some pictures of the, they've got little round ears and long tails. They're, they're, they're like a little rat possum. Yeah, that's a <laughs> lot of Australian animals, I think, could be called little rat possums. Um, anyway, they're yes, oilies, cute. they're cute. They're important. They're disappearing. And so Whoa. as as we do with many endangered species, uh, people have set up what in Australia they call conservation havens. We could call them refuges or um, protected areas or any number of things. Uh, but basically, they're they're fenced in or on offshore islands, they're predator free. And they're a space where the idea is you can breed a bunch of these guys at once. There is very little selective pressure. So you can get a really good population going and then you can release them into the wild. There's Sounds a lot great. of conservation programs like this that happen all over the world. But What's wrong with it? It sounds yes. great. <laughs> it's actually, it makes a lot of sense. It's something that um, it follows. If you think about the way this all works, uh, but despite the fact that their populations have increased uh, greatly inside the havens and 
They mm-hmm. think that overall about 13 extinctions in Australia have been avoided over various mammals because of these havens. Um, the issue is exactly what's so great about them. There's little selective pressure. So they examined at, through 10 years of monitoring that inside the haven where there were no predators compare uh competition for food was the biggest pressure that was pretty much the only selection on these guys so in that case bold carefree woilies ate before more cautious ones can you guess why that might be a problem <laughs> that would actually select for a behavior that might be more likely to get them eaten in the wild in the wild mm-hmm. yeah so and it's so great it- in that particular situation but yeah. other yeah in the wild not adaptive so the issue is yes you are you are create you are allowing for a large population to grow but you are not providing realistic selective pressures that they will then face in the real world and so in just four generations woilies born inside havens became um kind of more bold but also smaller and their feet became shorter the their feet became shorter yes yeah, so the, why the is that important is, yeah it, it <laughs> takes energy to build big feet and if they don't have to get away from predators in a hurry they don't need them mm-hmm. you yeah. don't know it's like oh it's like it's like the little it's like little feet yeah okay anyway yes yes and so in general it looks like they had a dampened response to um to predators one of the big ones that they do which actually a lot of marsupials do is they will eject their young from their pouch to distract predators while they escape which sounds really like a big bummer but it is essential to the survival of these animals if it is life and death and so if they're not doing that, then yeah, I know it's <laughs> That is the worst thing I've ever heard <laughs> an animal doing. <laughs> yes. Ah, don't eat me. Great. Here, but take my baby instead. If if you are a marsupial and you have a helpless baby in your pouch, yeah. the baby cannot survive without you. No, so hey. if your yes. choices so you are, run away faster. Your choices are you both die. Mm. Or the mm. baby dies, you run away, and you can reproduce Dude. again. I, so evolution that reproduce that goes another against day against every mammalian instinct that I have. But according to marsupial instinct, awesome. it's actually a I'll winning have strategy. More babies. So anyway, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> pull a baby out of my pocket, throw it at the predator. It's what great. this all means is that, first of all, in just a few generations, they lost their anti-predator defenses so if you know that going into conservation efforts then um you can know that you can't have multiple generations in a row living in these havens or refuges or protected areas or whatever you want to call them the other thing is that this means you need to expose these protected animals to threat predation or threat yeah yes now do you want to expose them to cats no those are not natural predators (laughs) But can you include natural predators in your space or can you train them to recognize predators? There's other research happening with that where like they're training Australian animals to recognize and avoid cane toads, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of potential options here, but essentially it's not enough to give them a, a coddled experience and then release them into the wild. You have to assess and give them a real realistic life in those havens so that they are set up for success when they leave hey hey are you all right are you is everything okay yeah yeah i'm fine dingo took my baby oh gosh i gave a dingo i gave it to him yeah (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. oh no dingo took it no 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 i gave it to him it was was me and the baby how about how about create havens that keep out the invasive predators yeah how anyway, about we how remove about it? the invasive? <laughs> Too anyway. hard. Uh, yeah, get rid of all the cats. Yeah. Yeah. Keep them inside. Solution. Keep them <laughs> inside. Anyway, or just get um, them. moving on. Really? So, so important information for the future of conservation efforts. What we have been doing may have been wrong, but the more we know, <laughs> the better we can do it. <laughs> the, in the, future. the more you know. Anyway, 
Sounds uh, like move, the problem's cats. Moving on. Okay. I, I want to, you're correct. I want to <laughs> talk more about um, mimicry. So like mimicry, yes, is a huge field of, uh, of zoology, looking at all the different kinds of mimicry that exist in the animal kingdom. I want to talk about one that was really kind of unusual that I wanted to bring up because um, I hadn't really ever thought about it. So usually you hear about conspicuous body colors from one animal who's poisonous or venomous or da dangerous in some way. And then another animal mimics that color so that they can benefit from the danger of this other species. So I might not be poisonous myself, but I'm bright red like the tomato frog. And so the animals avoid me as well, even though I'm harmless. Right. So uh, this is a common form of mimicry. Um, but in this case, this is looking at... Um, bombardier beetles, bombardier beetles, bombardier beetles, whatever you want to call them. Um, they, they are uh, an insect that ejects toxic chemicals at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius what? to repel enemies like frogs. No. Really? Yes. That's so, wild. I yeah, didn't know that existed. So it's toxic and hot. <laughs> Meanwhile, assassin, a type of assassin bug Serthenia flavipes. It doesn't do anything, does it? That's... No, it does. So that's oh. what makes this really weird. It exhibits a conspicuous body color that is very similar to the Bombardier beetle. But they also have a defense mechanism. <laughs> so th these guys both um, have reason to look scary. <laughs> They both have reason to warn predators. And for some reason, they look the same or hmm. similar. Similar. Very similar color. Similar. Similar colorings. Yeah. So to a frog, you're going to go, that doesn't look delicious. Um, Those both so, look brown and black. I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the assassin bug actually can like inject toxic. It's like a whole thing. They're it's they're really stabby. nasty. Yeah. They're very stabby. Mm -hmm. And so uh, researchers set out to kind of figure out how this happened. Who's mimicking who? Is it a coincidence? What is the benefit if they both have their own very effective defense mechanism? Why on earth would they look the same? Uh, and so they grab some frogs, some pond frogs which normally will attack both of these, the, the beetle and the assassin bugs. And they expose these frogs to one or the other, and then the other. <laughs> and so among the frogs, 100% of, of them rejected the Bombardier beetles. 75% um, rejected the assassin bugs. So initially the expectation there is that the Bombardier beetle is better defended against frogs than the assassin bugs. And then they switch it up. They showed them the other one. So frogs that had previously encountered one were less likely to attack the other. Always. Oh, look at him go. Bleh. <laughs> oh no, thank you. <laughs> Yucky. No, get me away. Um, and so if they had previously seen an assassin bug, they decreased their rate of attack on the Bombardier beetle uh, from 75% to 21%. So very effective. But if they uh, encountered the Bombardier beetle first, their rate of attack on the assassin bug went from 91% to 40%. So in both cases, a drastic change if they found one over the other. So this really seems like a mutualistic thing where they're yeah, like, hey, straight in, uh, category yeah, numbers there. Right? we live in the same area. We're both spicy. If we yeah. look the same, <laughs> They're spicy. animals they, will yeah, try to eat us less. Us. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's really wild. It's, I've never really heard of this before, that two animals who have their own defense, defense mechanism are kind of benefiting from the strength from in numbers. Other. Yeah. yeah. That makes that makes perfect sense. It's actually amazing that you don't see it more. 
I'm still tripping out very hard over the 100 degrees Celsius because yes. what is it like 80 degrees Celsius or something is already boiling like or you can make you make a cup of tea at 80 degrees. So this is probably an exothermic chemical reaction where mm. the the beetle is putting is together mixing, mixing yeah. some really? chemicals and ex- and expelling them very quickly so that the the yeah. beetle itself isn't containing this liquid. Well, yeah, it's probably no, chemicals that's being mixed still together. A, uh, yeah. yeah. That's still Pretty, very remarkable. Oh, it's it's incredible. Oh yeah. yeah. It's very cool. Not just and, scalding but burning. And it, that's what's so crazy is it's not enough that they are able to have this burning, stinging sensation. They're like, no, no, no. I'm also going to make sure to look like this other guy. So then I really want to know, and I don't know how we could figure this out in the fossil records. It's going to be so difficult to figure out. But, like, who ended up looking like who? Like, (laughs) who looked like this first? And then the other one was like, oh, yeah, yeah, like that, like that. (laughs) So it's... Is, at what moment did these two insects end up looking similar and and yeah and who copied who i'm just so curious or is it just nobody Convergent. was copying anybody but it just happened that way maybe I mean, right it's just is it, they were both speckled brown and black and the ones yeah. that looked similar to each other did a better job of surviving and so it just kind of mm-hmm. spontaneously happened which is totally possible Right, yeah. if they had the same background that they were living in right. and hiding in, yeah. uh, selection could have taken care of right. much of right. that for them. All sorts of that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and it, but it is also possible that one of them looked like this first, and the other one, it just so happened that, you know, the assassin bugs that looked like these beetles fared better, and then they slowly well, started looking more and more like them. That is yeah. also possible, and I'm just so curious... So wait a second. I mean, that's that's basically right. That's how mimicry works in the first place. It's not yes. that one tried to look like the other one. No. It's that yes. because it looked like the other one, it didn't get preyed on. And so that eaten. look yeah. stuck. And the ones that ventured off from that look, they got eaten. So they got taken out of the gene pool. You have two. They're just reinforcing each other for that, for that, uh, right. for that look. And so, yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. So, so either is possible. So, I, yes, I'm very curious what order this all happened in and if it did, in fact, happen at the same time. That's also fascinating. Yeah. But so there's a new kind of mimicry on the block. And that it's is bo- uh, where they're a both mutualistic bad. mimicry. Yes, where they're both honest. How about that? <laughs> yeah. They're both honest in their uh, warning coloration. I'm going to hurt you. Yeah, Hi. I'm very spicy. Don't Don't bite. <laughs> Don't bite me. That's what twist is. We're very spicy. Mm -hmm. But you do want to listen. Justin, now that you have a big sip of coffee, want to tell me about the science that you brought for this segment of the show? All right. So I'll try to do my quick stories now. Collective property rights leads to secondary forest growth in Brazilian Amazon. This Mm -hmm. is uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Researchers found that Collective property rights, this is local stakeholders, this is, these are indigenous territories of the Amazon, lead to higher reforestation rights. So the team compared secondary forest growth inside indigenous territories to the secondary forest growth on the land directly outside. And there's a couple problems with this study in, a, in, a, in just how they had to formulate it. Secondary growth is much greater, actually, in territories outside of indigenous territory. Because inside indigenous territory, you, there's, you don't have the slash and burn tactics. So there isn't a secondary forest. There's just the primary forest. There's the forest, right? So they had to find areas that were basically taken over by indigenous populations that had been clear cut and compare those to the area just outside that ter- territory. So they were looking at the same environmental conditions, even though by being adjacent to the indigenous territory, those forests probably fare better than territory that was far away uh, from, from there. So they found a two to 5% increase in growth and they found trees that were much older and so more robust on the inside of the indigenous territories in the fairest 
version of this test that they could have given the non-indigenous territories, if that makes sense. So uh, this is this is really amazing. There's 726 indigenous territories, covers 13.8% of Brazil, but it's about a quarter of the Amazon, which is then, then goes and extends into other countries. There are 250, more than 250 indigenous groups. They speak more than 150 distinct languages. Currently, there are 400 and something that have established territories because the, there's a, and the rest are sort of in the process of, of becoming official. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there's this, in the constitution in Brazil, back in the 80s, they created something called the, let's see, uh, Indigenous Peoples uh, Statute that legally protects people who have lived in the Amazon for tens of thousands of years to have some sovereignty over the regions that they inhabit. Meaning, yeah, the government can still decide that, hey, we discovered oil or gold and we're going to go dig. But right. the indigenous population can say, no, we're not going to allow farming in. No, we're not going to let logging in. No, we're not going to let you turn this into cattle grazing land by cutting down our trees. So they have they have legal power over over big aspects of how that land is used. Um, very important, not just you I mean, first of all, there's the civil rights of indigenous peoples involved. There's also the, you know, the carbon sequestration that is so crucial in the Amazon. You know, the Brazil has been doing a fantastic job of of secondary growth and protecting lands in their commitments to things like uh, Kyoto. Um, on the other hand, even, it's even though Brazil's gotten a bad name for deforestation. Well, so part <laughs> of how they're able to do that is because they've done so much deforestation that they have a lot of land that they can say they're now protecting. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. That they're double-edged they're sword there. Yeah. Rehabilitating. So, so they could be net nothing different in the course of a couple of decades, basically, by saying they're now uh, protecting land that they had just clear cut the decade before. Mm -hmm. so that's all word salad when it comes to governmental commitments, because again, governments have committed to planting forests or restoring forests or protecting forests that would be 20% larger than all of Europe or 30% larger than all of continental mm -hmm. United States. What is it? The thir the thirty so, the thirty and thir thirty by thirty thirty percent of the the land surface by twenty thirty. Yeah, uh, half protected. of farming. Yeah. Like the commitments yeah. they've made are absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, also, as a uh, noteworthy, there's a giant portion of our pharmaceuticals that are derived from Amazonian sources in yeah. Amazon plants. It's something like twenty five percent of the drugs we're still <laughs> using. Are, are derived from the Amazon. So it's a resource in a lot of ways. 40%, sorry, about 40% of pharmaceuticals are derived from plants. That's huge. Most of those were discovered in the Amazon and there's likely more to be discovered if we don't cut it all down. So, so this basic, basically though, the, the, the take home from all this is that when indigenous peoples are taken into account and their land use and land rights is taken into account, you have sustainable beneficial effects on yes the forests which we've also found on wildlife in canada when that's taken yep. place caribou yep. rebound under indigenous controlled territories at much mm -hmm. greater rates than they would anywhere else so anyway thankfully uh brazil's constitution has an indigenous uh, indigenous people's statute that legally protects people who have lived in the amazon for the tens of thousands of years my last story Amazing. is Brazil's Supreme Court is expected right. to issue a ruling uh, today, or have started looking at it today. Uh, they're maybe going to issue the ruling this week that seeks to challenge Article 231 of Brazil's Constitution, which, as it turns out, is the one that gives indigenous oh, no. 
the right to claim lands they have traditionally occupied. According to an article in Science, uh, the challenge to indigenous rights is being brought by farmers, loggers, miners, and other groups, although in reality, it's probably not the workers, the farm workers, the, the you know, the lumberjacks or right. the, the yeah. mine workers. It's the corporations who are behind them who want to send their workers into these lands to exploit resources who live nowhere near them. And they will never set foot on that land. I've been pushing for legislation to reinterpret the Constitution. And it's they, one of the requirements they have is that they would require all of the tribes to prove that they occupied those lands in 1988 or whatever it was when the Constitution was signed. Now, interestingly, proof that people were forced off of lands is is not part of the the new legislation. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's usually right. pretty well documented. Yeah, okay. yeah, it is. It is. But they're not but taking they, that into account. That's it's not like, going to be taken into account. Really they just want to say, hey, in 1988, yeah. well, we'll just stop right there when this was made a law. And, and so there have been hundreds of new indigenous territories added since then and expansions of lands. Uh, adoption of what's called the Marco Temporal, uh, Marco in the time frame of this, uh, Marco Temporal, that's what, it is, what it, this legislation is being called, could leave 87, uh, up to, what is it, up to 1 million square kilometers unprotected and negatively impact 95% of indigenous territories. Also, of course, a human rights violation. So... <laughs> Look for that in the news, Marco Temporal. Yeah, look for that. I wonder how much we'll be hearing about that one. Well, I'll be sure to vote for all. Oh, I don't live in yeah, Brazil. Yeah, we don't live there. Maybe our Brazilian listeners will be. But if you've ever them. wondered whether or not industry is going to help in the fight against global warming, the answer is no. Why no. would you wonder that? <laughs> if, if anybody was... Like because unless you it's, might see an advertisement, unless it's emerging where, industries, where a, a big corporation is talking about all of the good things it does for the environment. Greenwashing, greenwashing, it's always, and, always. Yeah, corporations. But they might not publish that study that says that their chemical is going to end up everywhere on the planet and not break down. Yeah, I don't yeah, trust those something. people. Corporations. No. Okay. All right. Moving on to the last few studies of the night. I have a, a couple of, of studies. Let's talk about um, not the, the drugs that come out of the Amazon, but related to our personal private health, our genomes. Very often we uh, donate DNA to uh, or genomic samples to large studies with the implicit assumption and usually with the wording from researchers that there's absolutely no way that anybody can identify this data from anything else. They're not going to be able to do that. Well, there is a new study that's just published in scientific reports called large scale proteomic studies create novel privacy considerations. Want to know why they create novel privacy considerations? Well, these large scale proteomic studies aren't looking at your genome. They're looking at the proteome. What's the proteome? The proteome is the set of Product. all proteins oh. that are produced. Well. So it's so, the, but... wait, wait, wait. So it's the proteins. These researchers were able to show that a, uh, a machine learning system that was trained on uh, proteomic data was able to track the proteomic data back to individuals when that proteomic data was associated with genomic data. Mm -hmm. Individual DNA level mm. identification. These researchers uh -huh. go on to say that based on um, their, their scan of 1.3 thousand proteomes uh, that did a what they say is a naive Bayesian approach to these uh, genome uh, to the genomes for two two thousand eight hundred twelve independent subjects. 
Uh, they correctly linked 90 to 95 percent of proteomes to the correct <sighs> genome. And for 95 to 99 percent, they were able to identify the one percent most likely links. They did find that they specifically had to have training sets with increased diversity to be able to improve the, the accuracy of identification of subjects with African ancestry. Not, I mean, everybody has African, you go far, far enough back, but specifically like African American. Um, with larger profiling, uh, they were able to, with specifically in the athro, atherosclerosis, scler, excuse me, let me say this word, atherosclerosis risk communities, correct identification was greater than 99%, even in mixed ancestry populations. So when they looked at very specific single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphisms, they were able to like draw these mutations back to very specific individuals. They linked proteomes to proteomes and used the uh, proteomes to determine features like sex, ancestry, and first degree relatives as well. Wow. I'm surprised. Yes. I am very surprised by this. I'm I'm shocked as well. This is amazing. This is because... ridiculous. This is what? <laughs> See, I feel, and I feel yeah. like I I raised concerns about this, and oh, I think I have been told by many people that I was being silly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and part of the like, part of the thing that is uh, part of the thing that would have made me skeptical about this is that. Your body can make ten to twenty thousand different proteins mm -hmm. based on genome. Yep. But then there's alternative splicing and editing and all sorts of stuff that goes on downstream that turns that into the five hundred thousand that your body needs to live. Right, but because so, they're so specific, the mutations that lead to particular proteins or to yeah. particular, and so the the, so the protein association to genetic loci within the DNA is it's is incorrect. accurate, and yeah, it's it's accurate enough that they're able to make very accurate predictions of identity. Right, and so it just might, uh, you know, and then the, the then the next thing that occurs is like, yeah individuals are going to have variants in different places and if you if you say that's a variant not a splice then it narrows down that pool considerably and then you have you know 500,000 uh, proteins that can have little signatures intermixed amongst them that something like yeah. machine learning would be able to backtrack into yep that yeah. From. So wow. when you're, you know, spitting in a tube for your ancestry.com relations or, you know, your 23andMe DNA where it's only single nucleotide polymorphisms and they're like, this is private data and nothing will ever be yeah. identifiable down the line, especially if we donate the data for scientific research, you know, this is, they'll never track anything back to you. Um, well, your proteins, if at some point your proteins are analyzed, yeah. it can be tracked back specifically, very accurately. So this is I incredible. I don't have a criminal past. Darn it. And, and so. <laughs> you say that. Is it I you say, say this? Just, but do yeah. you have a criminal future, Justin? That's the question. <laughs> I know. Well, maybe, future crime. Don't, uh, maybe I'm going to have to yeah. cancel all my future crime plans. because mm -hmm. Cancel it. Now I'm kind of on the record. I've done all those ancestry <laughs> tests and things. And mm -hmm. Is a pale human with a big brain floating in milk going to identify you as a perpetrator of a future crime? Yeah. And your DNA is the only way yeah. they will know who it is. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, they uh, they say they say their findings suggest an immediate need to change policy regarding non-genomic data used for research or commercial use. You think? Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's an interesting development there. Thanks, machine learning. You're awesome. Large scale association techniques are incredible. Yay. Okay. I think I'm feeling a little anxiety. Maybe that's going to make me depressed. And then I need to take um, psychedelics to treat my depression. <laughs> I mean, you, know you certainly I was going to do that anyway. <laughs> I think it's fine. 
<laughs> You're good. So good research solution. we've talked about on the show over the years has uh, suggested that uh, get, like that LSD and psilocybin can be potent antidepressants. However, they come with side effects. Yeah, especially if you do them both hallucinating. together. Hallucinating, yes. <laughs> but the hallucinations are something that not everybody enjoys. So researchers have been working very, very hard to figure out where these psychedelics touch the brain, where they connect with the brain, what do they, what receptors do they bind to, and uh, and, and how does that impact hallucinating, not hallucinating. Antidepressant properties, not antidepressant properties. And so uh, they, this research group publishing in Nature Neuroscience, they had previously reported uh, a study comparing fluoxetine and ketamine and showed that, the, and I've talked about that on the show previously, that ketamine acts by binding to uh, a particular receptor in the ends of the neurons in the synapse called the TRKB, T-R-K-B receptor. This is a receptor for brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a, a brain growth neuroplasticity receptor. It start, When BDNF gets turned on, it starts all sorts of synaptic plasticity action. So the synapses want to reach out and touch another synapse and make all sorts of new connections. And that's great for your brain and for your functioning as a social human being. So that was great. And so then they're like, let's move on to other drugs. And so in this study, they didn't give drugs to any uh, humans, but in a dish, they did compare how lysergic acid, dimethylamide, LSD, and psil psilocybin connect to that trick B receptor as well. And they found that psilocybin and LSD, um, they bind with a thousand times the affinity than SSRIs, than the fluoxetine, and even, even than ketamine. A thousand times better at binding to this BDNF receptor, the trick B receptor. They also overlap. They found that the domain of the binding at the at the membrane of the syn of this of these nerve synapses that the where it binds overlaps kind of with where the fluoxetine the normal antidepressants that we use bind with the receptor but they don't they don't match up exactly and so the LSD and psilocybin don't need to activate the 5HT receptor which is a serotonin receptor if you've ever taken, you know, uh, 5-H 5 5-HTP, 5 you're taking uh, something that can uh, that can impact your uh, your serotonin levels. Um, and so, the most of the SSRIs, we know that they act on this 5-HT receptor. We know that LSD does act on the 5-HT receptor, but it doesn't have to. It can have its antidepressant effects without binding. So if you if you just mutate things just a little bit, they are they are separate but but different. And so they found that uh, they can target. So basically, the research suggests that they can target trick B as the as the target for antidepressant for the antidepressant effect. If they try to create something that's like LSD or like psilocybin but doesn't also bind on to the 5-HT receptor that only binds to that, that trick receptor. And if it does that, then you can have a drug that will lead to a thousand-fold improved antidepressant effect with no hallucinatory impacts as well. And, and really, like, hallucination to me is a, too strong of a word. Optic, yeah. Yeah, optical illusions, uh, little yeah. optics going on yeah. there for sure. But hallucination is a little. It's people. It's hallucination. It's it can little, be. Yes. It's a little. But it's cool. New drugs. Maybe they will. Maybe it'll lead to improvements in how we treat depression in the future. Um, and maybe instead of having to have somebody guide you through a psilocybin or LSD journey to be able to have that uh, therapeutic effect, maybe it will be something that you can get, you know, a week's worth of pills and then you'll be fine. And, and by the way, the unguided, it's also pretty good. This was a, this was an old. Be your own anchor. Well, 
this is an old experiment, but they uh, apparently experimented with uh, prisoners in LSD, which I can't imagine that'd be like the worst place to ever want to be uh, doing LSD would be in prison. But it severely reduced recidivism rates. People who did LSD in prison were like, ah, I don't know if it was because of the LSD, or it was because they paying too much attention to stuff, or they got just who flipped knows? the switch. But they were like, I'm not going back. Nope. No, nope. Thank you. Don't want to do that again. Put things in perspective. I like not being in a concrete <laughs> box. Uh, we'll speaking of concrete. Doing crime. Yeah. <laughs> Let's stop that. Let's not do that again. No more crime. Uh, but speaking of a concrete box, how about putting a pigeon in a little tiny fMRI machine to study its brain while it's sleeping to see whether or not birds dream? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> well, researchers did what it. Are you, can we, oh, they've already done it. <laughs> they've what they, already what they done it. Well, um, what I'm guessing, did... yes. <laughs> Pigeon dreams? Pigeon dreams, yes. What they discovered is that, yes, indeed, pigeons do dream. So uh, the question is what they are dreaming mm. of. And so they were able to uh, raise a small number of pigeons from fledglings so that they were then able to take the pigeons and easily put them into an fMRI machine where the pigeons could would fall asleep and they could be monitored during their sleep to see uh, the rapid eye movements and also to have their brain imaged and scanned uh, to have that activity level, th those activity levels while sleep occurred. They uh, were able to train the birds and get them uh, get them into the fMRI machine and observe the rapid eye mu movement um, over a number of different oh, I'm not I have to I am screen sharing yay I have other things to share um, and they were so they were able to I think first off have the resolution to be able to look at the brain is pretty amazing um, and what they were able to see is that a significant amount of the brain activity was in areas during the REM sleep related to the wings. So the blood flow that occurred in the brain was a lot of, a lot of motor areas related to flight. And so the researchers think that pigeons dream of flying. Mm-hmm. So these pigeons don't just fly, they dream of flying. But not only that, there were also indicators that the amygdala was active as well. So there's a suggestion that the birds were emotionally stimulated or were emo their brains were emotionally active um, as they were dreaming of whatever flights they were taking. So are these predator dreams? Are there, um, you know, are what what's happening in, in the bird's limbic system um, is similar to actually what happens with humans. We dream about, our, we have emotional dreams. We have movement-based dreams. We have uh, all these things that go, that go together to help us put uh, scenarios in place for the future and uh, to consolidate memories from the past. Yeah. Other, other interesting aspects um, additionally relate to like when we sleep, one of the ideas is that the brain, uh, not, not only during REM sleep, but when you're not having REM sleep, that the brain is also uh, going through a period of waste removal. Right. So you're you're asleep and there's a lot of blood flow and that that blood flow is going to carry out waste metabolites and a lot of other stuff. And there's stuff leaving your brain and sleep is the time of day when that's possible. You can't do it any other time of day. And in mammals, it's constant. Our, our cerebrospinal fluid and brain transfer, it's like happening constantly. There's a 100% cerebrospinal fluid turnover and there's a big waste removal that occurs during that period of time. But in pigeons, apparently that's not the way it works. So in pigeons, when they were dreaming, they were not waste removing. And when they were not dreaming, 
that's when the brain had a lot of blood flow that was actually like mm. taking um, the cerebrospinal fluid and cleaning it all out. And they, they say that there were some compromises that might have been occurring to allow it to be a, an effective process that the REM cycles are shorter than they are in, in most mammals. So they're like, they dream for a shorter period of time and waste remove for a shorter period of time. So it's the cyc cyclic aspect of it was uh, shorter in nature. So maybe there's more on off, on off, as opposed to on dreaming. And we're waste removing a little bit. And, oh, no, I'm not dreaming. And we're still waste removing a bit. Um, and yeah. There are interesting I, questions about all this, though. But yeah, can I, do either of you ever fly in your dreams? <laughs> I you have know. not. I don't really fly in my dreams. No. Yeah, mm -mm. I can't. I have. I have. Uh, gravity still works perfectly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. I've heard of people yeah. though who can fly when they dream. I was, was wondering if maybe the pigeons like, ride bicycles. Right? <laughs> do they do other things? Drive cars. <laughs> They're like, can you can you uh, ride a bicycle in your dreams? No, I can't. No, I don't know. It's, all I can do is fly in my dreams. Yeah, but what if they still can't translate it? Or maybe they're if you teach a pigeon to ride a bike, does it then dream of riding? Then, a bike? Oh, huh. then. <laughs> does my dog Speaker dream of flying? Also, mm -hmm. I see her right. doing what this. What is happening? Right? Oh, no, oh, your dog is oh, running. Oh, dog is oh. great. I'm going on another walk. We're gonna go on another walk. She's chasing something good, and sometimes she's eating. Her mouth. Is good. Yeah, but this is the first time that uh, that that REM sleep has been tracked back to uh, to areas of the specific areas of the brain for brain activation in pigeons. That that mm -hmm. confirm that yes, indeed, pigeons don't just sleep. Yeah. And have eye movement, my eye movement. They also dream, of and course. they're dreaming probably of flying. And they are they're excited or scared about it, and they're they're yeah. emotional anyway. So anybody, any animals that have memory storage probably dream, right? That's any animal that goes through right. REM sleep probably dreams. That's, yeah. Sorry, we're not special. <laughs> we're not special. Not in the dream department. And I just I love finding out though it's like yes if you have so, ever wondered what a bird dreams of yeah they dream of flying yeah <laughs> no surprises so in, there in the justin jackson theory of how everything can't be convergent that would mean wouldn't it uh, dinosaurs dreamed yes and of that course. is uh yes that would suggest that our common ancestor probably dreamed as yeah. well. T-Rex dreamed of going. I mean, mammals were already around there. You have to go back even further. I don't know. Then do, do we know a fish dream? Do fish dream? I would assume. Yes. I right? don't know if they even sleep. I don't even know how that works. Oh, they do. One eye yeah. on, one eye off. No. Yeah. They don't have eyelids. All, <laughs> might, might not dream as well. So, <laughs> but dinosaurs, a... dinosaurs, if dinosaurs were dreaming, I wonder what the dinosaurs dreamed about. Hopefully not asteroids. They dreamed of eating those scurrying little mammals Furry at their creatures. feet that were so annoying. Oh little did goodness. they know. Little did they know. Wow. Have we done it? Have we finally reached the end of our stories? We've done it. We, so. we've, did it. we've done it. We've done it. I have one final uh, just tack on to the end of the show here as I go into... My big thank yous to everyone for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. As I'm digging into our shout outs, I have one huge shout out for Gerald Sorrells. Gerald is a longtime listener of Twists, started listening back in like 2010 or something like that, maybe even earlier than that, um, and has been supporting Twists for many, many years. In 2012, we got our first email from Gerald when he told us that Twist was influential in his decision to become a science educator. And then he updated us in 2017 when he received his associate's degree, uh, associate's degree after spending several years working two jobs and uh, putting all the classes together to be able to finish that degree. 
And at that time in 2017, he was planning to attend a program to receive a Bachelor of Science in Teaching Biology for secondary school. And this past week, we got another email. Gerald wrote in and said, hey guys, after helping my wife become a nurse, having a baby daughter, and moving three states, I finally became a science teacher, as promised to Twist so many years ago. Awesome. So awesome. That is I started, so cool. I started last year in November, and it's been such a roller coaster that I never had a chance to properly update you guys. And I also wanted the time to prove myself to you. High schools <laughs> across the nation are desperate for science teachers, and the science department I joined is no exception. They are a great team, but they are understaffed and overstrained. Full-time science teachers were grading students that weren't even their own students. Substitute teachers were stand-ins for anatomy and earth environmental because there was simply no teacher there to give lessons. Workloads were massive. They were very relieved that there was some kind of help. The simple fact is that they would never have had the relief if it wasn't for twists. It's, it's you guys that put the idea in my head so many years ago on my way to a bank job. Thank you from all of us to Dr. Kiki, Justin, and Blair. And he attached a photo of himself that he then is, uh, let's see if I can get this picture up here for the viewers um and he attached a photo to say oh, uh, this that. photo is of from january 9th 2023 of the twitch twist logo that i had brought that day long ago on stage for my on stage for my mdc graduation for the um for the bachelor's degree it's there for all the students parents, teachers, and administrators to see, framed by the door as they came and went. If anyone asked why I became a science teacher, I just pointed to twists framed on the wall. Keep on trucking, guys. You're all great. You're changing and informing minds a week at a time. Mr. Sorrell's Science Educator, North Carolina. That's, That's amazing. Fantastic. Thanks for listening, Gerald, and thanks for enlightening and educating our nation's I youth <laughs> i know i mean i'm I've got, i got goosebumps when i first read this email i just i sat and i cried for a minute <laughs> it's, it's it's honestly this kind of thing that um you know hearing about impact that keeps us going a lot um but also just to the the time and effort that and determination it, it took for you to become a teacher and just you're inspiring and thank you for your dedication to science education and for passing along your curiosity and wonder to the next generation um you know maybe of twist listeners listeners no <laughs> um hey and uh yeah, 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 yeah I gotta ask, hey the rest of you that have been listening <laughs> what have you well, been doing what have you been doing <laughs> Go out there and you think somebody needs to be, we need more uh, science educators, obviously. Get out there. Yeah. So, Gerald, I hope I hope you and your story, that you've worked so hard to get where you are, and we are so, so proud of you and just honored that you've shared this journey with us through the years. And how cool that, you know, you've got that, the Twist logo up. Um, that's just so fun. Um, yeah. Thank you for all your support through the years. And you know, this is a symbiosis, I think. I think we're all sharing with each other here. And um, I hope that your journey can help other people maybe pick up the inspiration to take a step in a similar manner. But it's now the end of the show. So, Ger Gerald, thank you so much for writing in. And Shout outs, as, as usual, go to FADA for your help with show notes and with the storied uh, show descriptions. Thank you for the social media work that you do. Gord, Arnlor, thank you for manning our chat rooms and keeping places safe and happy to hang out for all of our viewers while the show is going live. Thank you to Rachel for editing the show and Identity Fourth. even though you're having some studio issues, thank you for being there and recording the show week after week. It takes, it takes a whole team to get this thing done. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't thank, as usual, our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Kent Northcoke, 
Northcote, Rick Loveman, George Chorus, P.L. Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kor Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Vegard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Regan, Don Mundus, Pig, P.I.G., Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshack, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack Brian Carrington, David Youngbud, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Heston Flo, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Br Rent, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Rami Day, G. Burton Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, e Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Cardler, Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you all for your support on patreon and if you want to support us on patreon as well head on over to twist.org and click on that patreon link on next week's show we will be back wednesday 8 p.m pacific time and again thursday 5 a.m central european time broadcasting live from our youtube and facebook okay. channels as well as twist.org slash live yes Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps will you get ready for bed, preparing for your nightly dream of flying? Just search for This Week in Science if our podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes, links to the stories are available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for a newsletter. Is there a button? You can contact us directly as well. Email kiki at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into an Einstein ring, and we won't read it for, I don't know, a couple hundred million years at the at the minimum? Minimum. <laughs> Maybe longer. <laughs> Billion? Billions of years. Yeah. yeah. Especially with cosmic expansion. Yeah. Currently, we are not on any social media. Where we're <laughs> contemplating ending all social media until there's a good one again. Yeah. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Yeah, we're, we? on we're on Twitter on. if you can find us, on, but it wouldn't even Twitter. load my tweet today. I, uh, yeah. I don't know what happened, but it went bad. It went bad. <laughs> you don't know? I have an idea, but... That's, yeah. yeah, but we still want your feedback. Yeah, okay. So if there's yes. a topic you would like us to cover, address a suggestion for an interview haiku that came to you in the night, uh, just email it to us. Yeah, just we will be back topics. here next Figure week. how mail works. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week's science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science Science, science. science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations, and I've got a plan. Got a plan. Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? It's the after show. Justin will be back in just a moment. Blair is like, I'm done. It's bedtime for baby.
On yeah. non-twist nights, I go to sleep at 8.30. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I do have a big orange drink, Fada. It's my, it's my B vitamins. It's, it's, a, it's bubbly. It's got B vitamins. It's nice. I enjoy it. It's be, it tastes like orange. It's good stuff. Grubby the opossum, Eric Knapp says, speaking of invasive animals, it turns out Grubby the opossum brought kids with her. So we have opossums running loose in Homer, Alaska. Op opossums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all over the United States. They're originally mm -hmm. from Virginia. It's Virginia, from Virginia. opossum. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, now they're everywhere. <laughs> Don't feed them, please. Let nature feed itself. Mm -hmm. So apparently, I didn't know about Grubby the pos the opossum. Grubby, the, this is from Alaska Public Media. Grubby the opossum wandered into Homer, Alaska, and had been captured and taken to the Alaska Zoo. Grubby arrived in the Kenai Peninsula community in March after hitching a ride in a shipping container from Washington state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I guess that may, yeah, maybe they're not usually found that far North yeah, contiguous United here. States only. So it says here, the visitor yeah. quickly divided the town. Some wanted her captured and killed because opossums don't live in Alaska, mm -hmm. but some liked grubby launching the hashtag hashtag free grubby. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Homer it's police a... posted a Facebook post of the capture of the quote wanted fu fugitive and somewhat local celebrity. She'll it's be happier in a more temperate morning. climate for yeah. sure. <laughs> she I, does I not want to be in Alaska. I Just take her back to Washington. Or somewhat local. Yeah. Well, Just the other thing about opossums that people yeah. don't know and is kind of a bummer to tell people about is they mm. live one to three years. Oh, they're that short lived? Yes, because they're so they have cute. 13 babies at a time oh, and they can have, have multiple litters a year. And oh, so Alaska they basically reproduce now. to death. Yeah, good grief. They're, they're a boom and bust animal. Hmm. That's and a they, that's that's yeah. interesting. That yeah. I find fascinating. Yeah, opossums do not last long. Yeah, they do get as far north as Canada, apparently, but don't usually make it to yeah. Alaska. That's a bit far for an originally southeastern animal. <laughs> They're not well, talking about how long the opossum normally live, but they're saying that Grubby may stay in Alaska, remaining part of an exhibit on invasive species in the state. So probably what's going to happen is Grubby will live out her life at the Alaskan Zoo and then maybe become stuffed. <laughs> Fascinating, Eric. I had no, I had not heard about Grubby. Ah, the Grubby name came from Grub Steak Avenue, where she was first seen. Fascinating. So, um, I wanted to look it up because I, it's been a long time since I've done a presentation on opossums. I used to do them all the time. Really? Um, but uh, yeah, we used to have as them a zoo mobile. person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. um, but yeah, so so they can have five to thirteen young at a time. They can start having babies when they're very young um, and they have, they can have babies every, every three or four months. So that also means since it takes three months to wean the babies that they can have little jelly bean marsupial babies in the pouch. They can have 13 mm -hmm. babies on their back mm -hmm. at the same time they have this going on. At the same time. And they're they're like rotation they basically yeah they basically just reproduce to death is what they do it's a good thing they're cute and good at pest control they're cute when they're young for sure they're 
cute all the way through with those little sharp pointy teeth and they're when they get older teeth. so they they get these like fat deposits in the corner of their eyes oh, and okay. it, there's other things that it's they're not the prettiest when they're older who is <laughs> come on you know you're right <laughs> don't, don't be, judge. It's fine. Don't be age don't be I, age bashing i won't shame the the elderly <laughs> opossums it's fine. all right well i'm gonna go to i don't see pictures i don't i see pictures of opossums old opossum if you look for pictures of old opossum you don't get pictures of fatty eye bags oh well I'm going to look for pictures of fatty eye bags. Yeah, do it. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that'll be the name of my, my, my skincare line. <laughs> fatty eye bags. Oh my God. <laughs> <sighs> oh, sorry. <sighs> Twist approved. New yeah, the internet line. doesn't like to have these pictures. Also, like wild right. opossums usually don't get that old. They die when they're like one and a half. Oh, here's some. Oh. Do you find some fatty eye bags? Yeah, I did. Of course you did. The young ones are so cute. I remember the first time I saw a possum. An opossum. I didn't know I didn't I hadn't I wasn't oh. aware that they existed. I love opossums. I wasn't, I, for some reason, it just it missed it in school that day or whatever. Missed and there was it, one walking or along there in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was the biggest rat I had ever seen. <laughs> because they just look like giant rats. That's that's basically what they I mean, like. maybe. <laughs> look like People just rats. think that because of the tail. Kiki, yeah, did you so see this, this fatty tail. eye situation? I can, can I... see that. Okay, that great. I so want to stop it. I don't know why you're doing it. this to anybody. <laughs> well, I hope somebody listening to this podcast uses the name Fatty Eye Bags for Ugh. something. <laughs> because it's a great name. <laughs> oh, poor opossums. I think they're adorable. I love them. I think they are. Wonderful. They're very sweet. They're great education animals, too. And Rats are cute. Opossums so are rats. Are cute. Yeah, yeah. They're all cute. Squirrels are cute, too. Before you go, Blair, yeah. um, I was just wondering um, uh -huh. if which, which one of these uh, these things you like best. And I will send them. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> do you like that squirrel uh -huh. costume? Yeah, yeah. Or do we like, wait, where to oh, go? No. Here, oh, wait. that was cute. The, uh, there's a, pa a knitted <laughs> panda costume. I like this knitted oh, panda costume. <laughs> Isn't amazing? I feel like the tail on the squirrel costume is very impractical for an infant. It's very who, large. Who cares? Practical. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, man. Little panda costume. <laughs> little, I love this squirrel costume. I think this one might be that. Look oh, at this. Cool. Look at this oh, puffy gosh. tail. <laughs> Listen, no matter what you send, I promise to bring him on camera in it at some point. <laughs> oh, my God. It'll be amazing. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It is very cute. Squirrels and pandas. <laughs> I think maybe that's yeah, you know how people get known as like, oh, this is what you collect and everybody yeah. buys that thing for you. Yes. I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna buy mm -hmm. you squirrels and panda clothes for your child as long Good. as he will put up with wearing them. Good. Good. Yes. Well, eventually he'll be self-aware enough to know that he can do it as an act of rebellion. And I'm really in trouble. <laughs> Once that begins, yeah. then the real fun starts. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, Mom. I'm going to go put on my panda outfit. You'll see. 
you'll see i'll be wearing a panda outfit and you'll love it then yeah <laughs> mom. oh gosh that would be such a fun rebellion but what if i were a panda mom would you love me then of course honey <laughs> So I was watching, we got a panda in the local zoo, and I was watching it. They are amazingly dexterous uh, with their hands, or what do you call it? It's probably why they survived. Like, it was was holding the stick of bamboo and eating off the thing, but it was very casually, like, uh, just a very casual grip. It didn't look like, you know, like a bear you would picture to be grabbing something, but it's like, I'm I'm bear pawing this thing. Panda was had like just a grip. Like I'm surprised. Well, I, I I hate to break to you, Justin, but the panda is a bear. I I, I, I know this. <laughs> this is but this is what surprised me. It's like I don't I don't think of I don't think of bear paws as being that articulate. Like the way it was moving the sticks around, uh, bamboo with the the eat off of the thing. Like, You've that's... never seen a bear try and manipulate things to get at the termites inside of a tree. Yeah, yeah, or... yeah, but it's yeah, still like, like sloth like, bears, bear paw. sun bears, spectacle bear bears, bears. This black like, bears. This was like a proper grip. Like it was, it was it had a hand, which it just <laughs> kind of surprised me. It didn't look like a paw. It looked like it was using. It just had a hand. It was a like good grip. It was manipulating things like do 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 do. I'm going to make a salad better than a robo chef. Yeah. Oh, I want a panda, though. panda chef. Make me bamboo salad. Bamboo shoots. Uh, panda not, uh, eats, uh, shoots, leaves. God, can you imagine a salad of only bamboo shoots? <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty boring. Yeah, Eric <sighs> Knapp does bring up a pretty good point, Justin, which bears can open coolers. Bears can open car, car doors. doors. Yeah, but they yeah. but they bear paw it. They just they're swipe they're swiping at stuff. I think you need to pay a little more attention to some of the smaller <laughs> bears in the zoo. Black bears, spectacled bears, sloth bears, yeah, I, sun I bears. Got, you got need got to pay more attention and, to those I got individuals. Pandas and polar bears. That's all I have to choose from. Yeah, and polar yeah. bears they have snowshoes, so of course yeah. they're not dexterous. Right. But it was, I've never seen a bear. And I've seen bears. Kill, kill seals. Seen bears. Oh. I've never seen really, that, that artic- like it was just looked like it had hands. It was kind of uh, alarming. How it does. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly a new fear of pandas arrives on the scene mm. at Twiss. A fear mm. of pandas because of their hands. Yeah. They're not smart enough to know what to do with them, but it's fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> panda hate just has no no there's no, no end limits. no end it's They're very mistake. entertaining it's very entertaining they're it adaptive radiation that should have ended in extinction That's should have panda hey, out but but they survived they survived younger dryas a lot of a lot of there were no pandas face. in north america Top, I guess in the Northern Hemisphere. It was Northern Hemisphere, Europe but you're right. It was also. mostly yeah. seems to have impacted North yeah. America. But yeah. it also, well, no, because it hit, because there was, uh, it hit, uh, it hit over there in uh, Eurasia as well. I don't know. Maybe it made it all the way over. Mm-hmm. It can't be, it's not that far. Panda territory in the Pacific Northwest isn't that Pandas far were away. fine. They're like, I got my bamboo. Yeah. It's good. Pandas, pandas survived go. when I'm other wave my little panda hand at you. Predatory so bears it, did not make it. <laughs> Prairie bears? Predatory Lots of animals lasted predators. for longer and still became extinct because they were not an ideal. Hey, but, the, but it, now it turns out, now that I've learned it, that the younger Dryas was a cold snap that killed off the, the woolly mammoth. That Depends they were, you were living in warmer temperatures, temperatures but not too unlike European what they are now. Cold snap. All the way down in Southern California, even. Maybe, maybe that whole idea that it's too warm for the woolly mammoth and the climate's not right. Maybe that's not as true as we think it is. You're oh. way oversimplifying it, but I am. I am. I am. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. 
It's I don't have the energy to overcomplicate it. We're we're not going to go the other direction. All right. Let me take an idea that I have and overcomplicate it so it's hard to make my point. Now I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Who would do that? Who would do such a thing? Who would do that? Yeah, let's always go into the details first. All right. Blair's tired. She's yeah, two Blair's... hours past her bedtime. <laughs> Say good night, Blair. And even though she wouldn't have been sleeping, she would have been rolling back and forth going, I'm so uncomfortable. This baby yes, that's moving. accurate. I can't actually sleep. I, have, I wish I could sleep. It would be really nice if I could sleep. Yeah. I have to get yeah, a solid eight hours of that. You see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we were able to entertain you instead of yeah. letting you roll around. Yeah. Complaining about your sleep. Yeah. Um, good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. <laughs> or say good I morning, can't. Justin. Good morning, Justin. Good night. Kiki. Good night, everyone. I hope that you have wonderful bird dreams tonight. Sleep well wherever you are. Stay curious. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Oh, wait. Yeah. Stay curious. Uh, come back next week. Uh, get some good rest, Blair. And everybody, I hope you're doing great. Uh, that, was yep. a, that was a nice, tight 150. <laughs> ah, end of broadcast. <laughs>